hey, hey, party people, let's talk about sustainable fashion or eco-friendly fashion, environmentally friendly fashion, low environmental impact fashion. However, you've heard it. Let's talk about it. It used to be that when people heard these terms that they immediately thought of hippie clothes in various shades of olive green, but that's not really the case anymore. I have 15 ways that you can introduce more sustainable processes into your fashion brand without stifling your creativity and in some cases really push your creativity. For the sake of some sort of, you know, organization, I'm going to put them loosely in order of design process. Number one, easy one, eco-friendly office supplies. You have a ton of recycled paper and eco-friendly ink options out there. So please go explore them and use them to create your mood boards for yourself, for your team, uh, all your office paperwork. Number two, organic fibers. Really quick. Basically, fabric is comprised of two elements. Number one, the raw materials. So the fiber, cotton, silk, wool, acetate, polyester, rayon, and the construction. So whether it is a, a twill weave, like denim is, or a jersey knit, which is what a lot of t-shirts are, okay? That's the knit or the weave or the specific type of knit or weave is the construction. You put those together and you get fabric. Okay. There are organic fibers, uh, there is organic cotton, hemp, bamboo, and linen, flax, aka linen. Essentially, organic fibers are plants, like cotton, that are farmed without pesticides, insecticides, herbicides, you know, harmful chemicals like that. This kind of farming is better for the environment at large. Side note, you know, the argument versus natural and synthetic dyes is kind of ongoing, and there's pros and cons for each. On that, I don't have a definitive, this one is better. So please do go explore those options yourself. Number three, you can also use recycled fibers. The made by environmental benchmark for fibers has have these classifications for which fibers have the lowest environmental impact. And they're class A, the lowest environmental impact fibers include recycled, oh, excuse me, mechanically recycled polyester and nylon, organic flax, aka linen, hemp, organic hemp, uh, recycled cotton and wool. I'm gonna drop a link to the report in the description box below. Do check it out. It is the condensed version, so it's fairly easy to read and follow along, and it is full of good information. Number four, fabric and fiber brand names. Not everyone knows that there are brand names for fabrics and fibers, and there are. One of the most commonly known ones is Lycra and spandex. So spandex is the generic term for stretch elastic, you know, and Lycra is a company and they have their own special way of making stretch fabric. And so there are other such companies. There are a lot of companies that process linen, but there's a company called Kralar Flax that has a proprietary process that is more environmentally friendly than other linen processes. And you can see this information also on the Made By report, but it's good to check those things out as well. Number five, using textiles from scraps. Tonle is one such company that gets scrap from these big mass market fast fashion chains. You know, they cut like 100,000 t-shirts in one go. They take the scraps from those cuts and they reweave it into brand new textiles for their brand. And I've seen them in person and they are beautiful. Uh, literally zero waste, excuse me, a little, like they are negative waste because they are taking someone else's waste and turning it into something beautiful and usable. Number six, vintage fabric. I took some summer classes at Central St. Martin's back in 2000 because I am 738 years old. And I had the privilege of taking a class taught by Jessica Ogden. Back then, Jessica Ogden was a women's wear designer. She was showing in London Fashion Week and she was known for making her garments out of vintage fabrics. And when she ran out of that fabric, that was it. <laughs> she, 
she didn't produce anymore. And it did kind of lend a sort of like, gotta get it now before she runs out sort of fervor, kind of like added kind of to the allure of her brand. Number seven, zero waste patterns. Zero waste patterns are patterns in which, you know, you take a piece of fabric intact and you, you don't cut out pieces out of it. You make cuts into the rectangle of fabric. And then of course there's strategic cuts and you line up, you know, two cut edges and sew them together. And that's how you create the garment. I really don't know a whole lot about it. Other than I have seen some examples of zero waste cut garments and they are beautiful. And I was going to say cutting edge, but that just seems too terrible of a pun. <laughs> They're quite avant-garde, they're beautiful, they're interesting when done right, and please don't ask me for a tutorial on zero waste cutting because I don't know enough about it. Long time viewers know that if I don't know something, I will just say I don't know instead of trying to bullshit my way out of a barrel. No, but seriously, Google it. There are some beautiful examples out there. It's a subject worth exploring and learning, and if you're a designer who really loves exploring new silhouettes, this can be a really awesome avenue for you. Number eight, garments made from scraps, which is different from textiles made from scraps. This is creating the whole garment from scraps. You know, Tomei does this where they take the bigger scraps and they cut pattern pieces out of it. A uh, company, uh, there's that company Zero Waste Daniel. They do a line of genderless basics fabricated completely by pre-consumer waste uh, collected from the garment industry all over New York. What is pre-consumer waste? Let's say company X, they use a fabric and they cut their pieces and they have all this fabric scrap left over. That is pre-consumer waste, okay? So this fabric, it hasn't been used by an end consumer like you and I, but it is something that's going, that's headed for the trash can. Companies like Zero Waste Daniel, they will take that pre-consumer waste and they will use it to create a new garment. Number nine, pay your scraps forward. There are companies that will buy your scraps. No, you will not get full price on your scraps. You will get a lot less money, but you will still get some money. The whole point of these scrap companies is to buy your scraps so they can sell it to someone else for them to also use. So the whole point is to get someone to use the scrap. There are also uh, charities where you can donate your scrap. And then in turn, these companies, organizations, whatnot, they will sell your unused scrap and other sewing supplies, you know, really cheap. A lot of them, they will sell them to like families and schools so that kids have budget friendly options for when they want to work on a project. And these companies, they will give you a tax write off receipt for your donation. So, you know, you're getting a tax write off for your business and you're helping some kids work on some projects without, you know, making their parents go broke. Win win, right? Leather scraps are especially coveted by jewelry makers and other crafters because leather is one of those materials where you don't have to know the grain line to cut it. You don't have to keep the selvage intact to know where the grain line is and try to you know, match up the grain line. There is no grain line in leather. I used to sell leather scraps by the pound in my Etsy store back when I was doing like all these you know, handmade leather corsets. Number 10, speaking of leather. If you watch my interview with Kathleen Fascinella, we had a couple of conversations about sustainability and one of them was about leather and Kathleen, who has been a vegetarian for decades, thinks that if the leather comes from a food animal, like a cow or a pig, then it's okay to use the leather because it's that whole concept of using the whole animal. A couple of other notes, vegetable tanning processes exist that do not use harsh chemicals like chrome and you know, they're better for the environment, they're better for the people who handle the leather and they will allow the leather to become eventually biodegradable. And I say eventually because leather is one of those materials where if you handle it and take care of it well, they will, though, leather items will last 
more than your lifetime. Other notes on leather, there are fake leathers and you know leather is such a coveted material that there are companies that are trying very hard to mimic leather but more sustainably. So there's soy leather, there's leather made from mushrooms. I found out from one of the people who came to my Warsaw meetup, she told me that they're making leather out of mushrooms. And they're also making leather out of uh, pineapple harvest waste. I'm so into it. There are all these options. Please do go explore and design and have fun. Speaking of the biodegradability of leather, that brings me to my next point, number 11, make quality stuff. One of the big goals of sustainability is to not keep filling our landfills with more junk that will never go away. So make quality garments that will actually last, that people will keep them and keep wearing them. Part of that is a more classic style. Part of that is the quality of the production. When I had my line, my sort of company tagline was future heirlooms because my goal was to make quality garments that, you know, people wanted to keep and hand down to their future generations. Number 12, upcycling garments. Upcycling clothes means taking existing garments and changing them to make them look new. And you can find pieces in thrift shops and do this, you know, one at a time and sell these unique garments. You can do custom orders, which means that the customer would have some say in the final result of the design. Or you can just go and do a bunch and sell them and they, they will all be unique one-offs. I have this fantasy. I'm wondering if I speak it into the universe that someone can make it happen. You know how there are all these fast fashion brands that dump tons of dead stock into landfills because they made too many and they didn't sell? I have this fantasy that companies, that these companies would sell the dead stock on the cheap to some other design house. And that design house would upcycle these garments and try selling them again. You know, if, they, if the fast fashion companies want to be pr proprietary about prints that they develop, Maybe they can start this process by only selling basics where the fabric isn't the key point of the garment. This might sound nuts. This might sound improbable, but think about this, okay? Right now, and for a long time, companies like American Apparel have been selling basics in bulk to other companies. And these companies, they'll change it up a tiny bit. Like usually they'll silk screen a graphic onto the front of the t-shirt and then they'll sell it with their label on it. Okay? I don't think that my idea is that much different from that. So anyway, that's just an idea I had. You know, I'm really into upcycling. You know, upcycle your own wardrobe instead of buying more stuff. You know, whatever. 13. Speaking of dead stock, let's talk about lean manufacturing. Specifically, I want to talk to you about push versus pull manufacturing. Push manufacturing is make to stock. And pull manufacturing is make to order. Make to stock means that you have decided how much inventory you want based on research of how much you think will sell and you make that much. Make to order is when you collect orders and you cut based on the orders that you get. This can be in general, like in the wholesale sense, you distribute your sales material to wholesale buyers and you give them a time window for them to order. Like, please submit all your orders by X date. And then you collect your orders and then you produce that amount on the direct to consumer level. You know, you can put out there, we, you know, you can put right on your website, hey, we cut to order. So please allow X number of days before we will send you a shipping notification that your garment has been finished. The key to that thing though, is to make sure that every customer, crystal clear, crystal clear that every customer knows that they have to wait for their item to get made. Okay. Because people, if they want it, they, they will wait, but you have to let them know in advance instead of letting them sit at home and be like, where is my stuff? So there's that. But you know, the thing with direct to consumer retail, when you do stuff like that, you have to at least keep your raw materials. 
in stock. So there is that a little bit. But you know, pull manufacturing is lean manufacturing because you're reducing the possibility for dead stock, for unused inventory, stuff that's going in the trash. Number 14, think about the care for your garments. A laundry isn't really something designers think about very often, but they should because more water and chemicals are used in the care of a garment within the garment's lifetime than in the creation of said garment. I mean, unless you're literally buying a dress where it wants to throw it away. That's a problem all, all separate. You know, do some research on the care for your clothes. You know, using a drying rack, using the cold water setting reduces energy use. You know, recommend eco-friendly uh, detergents and dryer sheets that are packaged in biodegradable packaging. You know, really research what really needs dry cleaning. And dry cleaning, you know, dry clean only, that label, it's lazy. It is. It's usually like when a brand slaps dry clean only on everything, it means that they didn't run any wash tests. They didn't really test their product. A lot of the time, hand washing works just as well, especially for uh, natural fibers. I think it would be a really great idea to include a tiny repair kit, you know, on a hang tag, you know, with your, you know, your brand hang tag and then a little tiny repair kit. And, uh, you know, depends on the garment, right? Like for jeans, you can include a patch or two and some thread for Chunky knit sweaters, you can maybe include a little bit of yarn and teeny tiny darning instructions, how to darn a hole. Or you can just put on your hang tag for further care and repair instructions. Please visit our website, you know, zoehong.com. Listen, it never hurts to give your customers reasons to visit your website over and over again. Am I right? And just to have them there instead of, you know, having this little label and having your customers try to figure out what all these little symbols mean, because I don't know what these symbols mean. This is my industry. I still don't know what those stupid symbols mean, right? But if I could just go to the website and say, all our t-shirts that are made 100% cotton should be taken care of like this. And our jeans should be taken care of like this. And, you know, and have that kind of customer service as well as being more sustainable. Number 15, rethink your packing and shipping materials. Do you really need to cover all your clothes in those one-time use poly bags or is there a better option? What are your hang tags made out of? Are you still using styrofoam packing peanuts for shipping? There are many recyclable and biodegradable options, so please do your research. Think about your average, you know, moderately successful fashion house and how often they're shipping stuff out the door and how much stuff that is. Yeah. Okay. So again, this should be just a jumping point for your own research. I know it'll be really hard, near impossible to incorporate every single one of these 15 ideas into your brand, but I am also almost certain that you can incorporate at least three fairly easily. Have fun exploring your options. Please like this video if you learned something new today. Uh, share, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and I will see you in the next video.